Hello, everyone, and welcome to Things, a Global Conversation, presented by Old Salem Museums and Gardens and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. My name is Samantha Smith. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Digital Learning at Old Salem Museums and Gardens, and I'm also the head of the Cherokee Advisory Committee here at Old Salem. In each episode of Things, we will aim to use objects to draw out larger connections between people across historical, geographic, social, and political lines. In today's episode, we're going to put two objects in conversation with each other, a basket made by a now unknown woman ancestor and placed in a museum collection by a British colonial official, and a 25 pound push broom with the handle broken off which was used as punishment in a mission school for speaking your native language. These things provide us an opportunity to explore the attempted erasure and resilience of indigenous peoples and cultures in the Southern Woodland, now known as the American South and Tasmania. Joining us this evening are Watson Harlan, historian and advisor on the Cherokee Advisory Committee. He's coming to us live from his home in Paint Town Township in Cherokee, North Carolina. And we're also joined by Julie Goff, an artist, writer, and curator who lives in Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, for those of you joining us live, thank you so much for joining. We encourage you to send your messages in the Q&A, send us your questions in the chat. Um, you can use either function, Q&A or chat, and you can do that throughout the conversation. We will address those questions at the end of the program. So first, we are going to begin this evening with Watson Harlan and an artifact from his personal collection, a heavy push brush that was used to punish Native children in a mission school. Um, Watson Harlan is a member of the Cherokee Nation of the Bird Clan and was born and raised in Cherokee, North Carolina. He graduated from UNC Asheville with a BA in history and a minor in Native American and Indigenous Studies. He works as a historian and a cultural consultant for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and is an advisor on the Cherokee Advisory Committee at Old Salem Museums and Gardens. He currently lives in Paint Town Township, Aniwadahi, in the Kuala Boundary, and he primarily studies colonial Native American history in the Southeast, Chinese socioeconomic theory, and historical fencing. A proponent of living history, Watson practices several traditional and historical arts, such as Appalachian Mountain Dulcimer, historical German longsword combat, traditional Cherokee games, such as Marbles and Chunky, and traditional and historical food culture. He also has worked on multiple ecological preservation projects and currently enjoys sitting at home, playing music on his porch while waiting for the work calls to come in. Watson, uh, thank you so much for starting us off tonight, my friend. And uh, just another reminder for anyone joining us live, if you have any specific questions for Watson, please drop them in the chat or the Q&A. Thank you, Watson. Thanks, Samantha. So tonight, after we've talked about all those interesting things that I do, we're going to now talk about a push broom. So, all right, I've got it right here, and it's about 25 pounds. Um, I weighed it by standing on the scale in my bathroom, but this particular object is one that was part of the old Cherokee boarding school, which um, was operating as recently as 1955, and with the day schools later closing in, 1973 for the one in Snowbird. Um, the boarding school program was begun as a <clears throat> religious partnership with the Quakers, the Society of Friends, and then later um, it attracted attention from the federal government. So these boarding schools were programs that were um, on a surface level supposed to teach Native kids how to live westernized lifestyles. So while this did come with things like learning industrial and agricultural knowledge, uh, workshop uh, tasks, and uh, certain literary capacities and a Western style education, it also came with a decidedly violent take on trying to prevent people from behaving in ways that were inherently Cherokee or native. So this included forbidding the speaking of Cherokee under any circumstances while at the school, um, the cutting of, of hair, the prevention of people from wearing their hair in braids, no traditional clothing, no storytelling or no traditional stories, um, no traditional practices whatsoever. Even the food had to be westernized. So this particular brush was weighted and had the handle broken off of it and then hammered into it 
for the express purpose of punishing children for behaving Cherokee. Um, they, they're sort of formal in, po in policy, but you'll hear a lot of informal stories from people who went to these boarding schools. Um, one in particular that stuck out to me was, an, was a local elder who passed away a few years ago, Jerry Wolf. Um, when he was at the Snowbird Day School, he would always um, at night sneak out and go behind one of the teacher's houses to play in one of the grapevine groves because it was one of the few places uh, there that he could speak Cherokee with his friends without um, fear of repercussions. And my grandfather, actually, um, John Francis Harlan, went to one of these boarding schools and as a result, um, not only didn't get to learn to speak Cherokee, but actively discouraged it amongst his children because of all the negative things that he suffered in life as he was growing up. Um, so it's, it's had a very uh, tan tangible and palpable impact on this local community and native communities as a whole. Um, so this particular brush is quite symbolic of a lot of historical things that happened very recently within history, um, within my grandparents' generation. Even some people that are around my mom's age can remember the closings of these things and the impacts that it had on them. Um, it's contributed to a large unwillingness by certain uh, people to want to interact with Cherokee culture and capacity because they've suffered so many ramifications for those things, for speaking the language, for telling the stories and participating in traditional crafts. And it, um, it also instilled this idea that westernized education was inherently superior to traditional upbringing, even though there are lots of historical examples in particular of my people in Cherokee having a hybridized Western and traditional education. Um, the, the brush in particular is something that we picked up as the boarding school was being closed and it's been in my family for, I guess, three generations. Um, it sits on my porch now and I use it as a boot cleaner when I'm not talking about the historical significance of it as sort of. And Watson, we're losing your internet connection. Would you mind turning your uh, video off? So what that tends to do in Cherokee communities as a whole, um, the Western education, what happened with that was you would be taught, especially uh, Christian theology and lots of things that were designed to convert and assimilate large bodies of Cherokee people. So you can see that there's about a generation and a half of Cherokee people that grew up in their childhood with their own culture being vilified and punished for being practiced in the open. Um, simultaneously, that's occurring in my particular region in North Carolina with outside pressures that are further eroding um, Cherokee sovereignty over our own cultural practices. Um, so today, it's left a lot of people without the ability to speak Cherokee, without the ability to know their traditional stories or upbringings, and without being able to do lots of the traditional Cherokee crafts. So as you can see, um, the little top where the normal broom handle would be has been hammered down into it. This was done before I used it as a boot cleaner. It was done so that you couldn't put a handle into it. And you have to keep in mind that the kids who were being forced to scrub floors with this thing were elementary schooler age from around nine to like 12. So. This is something that's happening to very young children that are just growing up. And some of these kids at the boarding school were forcibly removed from their homes and went through a tremendous amount of struggle. Um, them were malnourished at these schools. My grandfather recounts that um, sometimes all there was to eat was a little bit of salted pork and maybe a biscuit or cornbread. So there is a fair amount of you know, honest cruelty that happens in a lot of these places and it tends to be subsumed and forgotten in recent American history, despite the fact that the last boarding school around here closed just in the 50s and the day school closed in the 70s with many of the assimilationist practices and education continuing to exist 
in American education in some capacity or another, even today. Um, we still struggle with North Carolina, for example, not counting Cherokee language courses as uh, second language courses for children and uh, high schoolers that are living in Cherokee now. So it's presenting a huge challenge because it puts an extra strain on our um, to try and learn a language while also still having to learn a third language as a result of it just not counting for educational credits in the state of North Carolina. So this object is, I won't say it's important to me because it's sort of a monument to the absence of something within my culture. But what it is important to is that it's an important monument to the memory of what happened. And it's something that I can't really let um, the cultural consensus of America just forget casually because it was an object of intentional oblivion that was brought to my people for the sole purpose of erasing their identity and subsuming it into the greater colonial mindset. It's a deeply uncomfortable object and it's a deeply disheartening object, not only due to the actual quality of the object and how it was used, but the recency of it, that it is not something that's foregone. There are still lots of people alive today that had that would be acquainted with this object in its appropriate context, if one could describe it as such. So that's what I feel is most important about this particular object and why I feel like it's important that we discuss it when talking about uh, cultural erasure and modern native history, because one cannot remove native history from the greater culture of the States of America and of the colonial world as a whole without deeper insight and discussion into recent issues that are continuations of trends in centuries past. It's really important to me that we discuss this object and to see this object because it removes native history from the mythic past. It places it in a very real space in a real time at a place that's very close to me geographically and close to my heart you know um when you hear about kids getting beaten or occasionally whenever they would dig up um a site um one of the reports that they found at one of the boarding schools they were finding skeletons of kids that were killed because of punishments and things done for the sake of killing the indian and saving the man and in some of those cases they killed the man too you know it's a it's a bit of a a mundanely tragic object in what it represents with its weight and it's a sort of inescapable little bit of history that i like to keep on my porch so that i can think about it sometimes and so that i have something to clean my boots off in the rain and in the winter wow watson uh thank you so much for bringing this object I think unlike a lot of the other things, conversations, um, this object is definitely a lot different. Uh, most of the objects that we are talking about in things are ones that are carefully preserved, put in special collections. The, the one that we're gonna talk about next is a piece in a collection. I think it's really interesting on top of the personal connection you have with this object of trauma, uh, it's interesting to think about how it is now being used, especially talking to a lot of people who are preservationists. I, I can't wait to jump into this um, later on during the conversation. Um, thank you so much. We will get back to Watson um, as soon as we hear from Dr. Goff. Uh, we will have time for um, Watson, uh, Mr. Harlan and Dr. Goff to talk together about their two objects. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Julie Goff. Um, she is joining us from Tasmania, Australia. Uh, Dr. Goff is a Travelway Tasmanian Aboriginal artist, writer, and a curator of Indigenous cultures at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. Her Briggs Johnson family have lived in the Latrobe region of Northwest Tasmania since the 1840s, with Teberkuna in far northeastern Latrida, which is Tasmania, their traditional country. Goff's art and research practice often involves uncovering and representing conflicting and subsumed histories, many referring to her family's experiences as Tasmanian Aboriginal people. 
Since 1994, Dr. Goff has exhibited at more than 130 exhibitions. She holds her PhD from the University of Tasmania in Visual Arts. In 2018, a monograph of her art, Fugitive History, was published by UWA Press, and her short fictionella, Shale, was produced by a published event. Uh, Goff's artwork is held in most Australian state and national gallery collections. Julie, thank you so much for joining us tonight from so far away, uh, both in space and time. Uh, if any of you joining us live have questions for Dr. Goff, please drop them in the chat or the Q&A, and we will address those after the presentations. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, just um, call me Julie, for starters. Um, yeah, so I um, am speaking to you from the country of the Moomarimina people who did not survive British colonization of this part of southern Lutruida or southern Tasmania. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking also from the, it's the conference room in the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, where I work as one of four staff, uh, we're first people or indigenous staff in the first people art and culture collection in, uh, in TMAG. And I'm, I'm sitting with my colleague, Karen Ricky, Pacific Cultures Curator. <laughs> Uh, team member. So yeah, today um, it's um, really great to be speaking internationally about a very special object and one of very few that survive in the world to my knowledge, which is a basket made by our ancestors here. Uh, and it, probably in 1850 is the date we're thinking the basket was made. And it's more than one basket. It's representing uh, the, the person that made it, the ancestor. It, it's representing um, the time between then and now and uh, those um, amongst our community who have um, brought, ba brought baskets back to being for us by learning again what was asleep as a, as a cultural skill. It, in the times through which um, Watson was referring to for his own people, um, we, our ancestors by the 1830s were um, mostly held captive with sealing um, men who were sealers from Britain off uh, the northern coast of our island on smaller islands, or we were captive uh, at Waibalena, a government establishment uh, on Flinders Island, which closed in 1847. And then uh, those ancestors that survived that were um, less than 50 people taken to uh, Oyster Cove, uh, Kudalina, its original name, uh, now reinstated south of Hobart. And it's from 1847, they became an interest in collecting our cultural objects, in particular, uh, a spate of collecting by uh, British people wishing to send them to various great exhibitions or um, as the first one in London, 1851, was where this basket was destined, but didn't go. It, uh, another group of baskets went across to London where they remain in the UK to my knowledge. So I thought I would um, show you the basket now and then show some slides um, that I've prepared about, um, in a way the basket is our ancestor or one of our ancestors. It's also unknown who made this basket. And this is so much the state of our cultural objects from the 1800s is that they went through such um, removal from us, from country and, transported globally, it, they represent also what happened to our ancestors who were as referred to as human remains sent in the same manner to various collections. And this basket is known in the collection world as M2735. Um, and uh, it sits uh, label in the, the cataloging sense. Um, and our basket's made in a very specific manner that only in the far north of Australia is it similar to, but ours is a reverse um, S stitch twined method. It's very, um, there's a very few plants that they're made from. Um, and as I said, it's been, um, they're now being made again since the 1990s in particular by a few dedicated elders. And it's been now passed um, through the community, there's more women that can make them uh, than then, but it's still there's a ways to go for it to be an everyday cultural practice again. So very fine work. Um, I'm going to talk, show some images um, from my um, slides to talk about the plants as well. So this is a median size 
basket, there's double this size and then down to half this size, depending on what use the, the basket was once um, utilised for. I mean, this idea of them being captive in museums, they're, they're not utilised for their intended purpose, but also this basket was, as I mentioned, um, one that came in a group of 10 that arrived in 1851, the same year as the Great Exhibition in London, and uh, by the man, uh, Joseph Milligan, who was responsible for um, not only establishing this museum, one of the key um, people who determined that there should be a museum in Hobart, but also the Royal Society of Tasmania, I think the earliest in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, also, he was a medical man and he was also the commandant at um, Waibalina on Flinders Island, the camp in which um, many of our ancestors were kept captive and also then Oyster Cove, which I mentioned where this basket was likely made. So these, these, uh, this is one of a group. I'll, I'll um, show you the, some of these images so you can get an idea. Um, this is where the basket normally lives on the shelf. Uh, upstairs in this, in this uh, we're in the research facility and storage facility of Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery uh, where it resides. Um, there's many language words that survive to refer to the, the plants used in these baskets and also um, the, the making of the, of the basket. Also our kelp carrier, one of our un other unique objects here, which is like our, our bucket, traditional bucket. And this is how they looked in a lantern slide, the 10 that came in the same year. Um, so yeah, we're not sure of the year of the lantern slide, but the baskets were in a bit of a state of um, compression to put it in a, use a polite word. And this is the, this is the kind of family of baskets that um, live here in TMAG at, at this time, but in a kind of suspended animation that museums require of their objects, a kind of stasis to keep them um, in you know, sort of suspended animation. 17, and there's 39 known in the world right now that survived from uh, the 1800s of our baskets. Um, we, there are at least 70 women or girls who could have made uh, this basket, um, but it, it's likely to be less than 30 uh, women or girls given um, the age, the date in which this basket was likely commissioned and made and not sure if for any payment um, by the, this uh, the unknown woman that made this work. Um, the French and the British um, depicted some of these works, these baskets in, in earlier artworks from the 1790s. And there are likely others that survive overseas, for example, in France that have not yet been located from early voyages in the 1790s and 1802 to our shores. Um, for example, the kelp water carrier you can see on the right in this image has recently resurfaced in Paris where it was registered as an African object. Um, so it's, you never know where some of these ancestors objects might um, you know, resurface literally. And um, I'll be showing quickly some images and um, the ideas of you know, how they came to leave our shores uh, and, and the conditions in which they were made, you know, there's big question marks in, in, um, in, that, in that, their journey of making and, um, and travel. Um, yeah, this is more about, again about the French and how they um, left our shores with uh, various um, two baskets in this instance. That's the Dontricasto expedition. Uh, and then the British coming, um, establishing their um, colony here in 1803, and um, not many bothered to learn our languages. Uh, this man Robinson was commissioned by the government to essentially remove us from this island to offshore detention on Flinders Island. Uh, but his journals are, are useful in trying to establish what was happening. And in that, some of that does refer to how we um, some of our cultural makings. And this is Milligan, who I mentioned, who um, ended up retiring and dying in England, as did Robinson, who I mentioned. Um, so my ancestor, who um, lived on Waibalena, uh, Flinders Island, her name was Waratamaratiena, and she was one of a group of women who were trading, bringing in animal skins and grass for thatching, and, and they were 
uh, at Wyberlena at a time when there was a marketplace established by Milligan for people to actually sell cultural objects to passerby people uh, and those that were working there who are non-Aboriginal. So there's an interesting case there of, of um, what at first seemed to be prevented as in practicing culture, using language, using ochre, um, like our body adornment and uh, et cetera, uh, and also not um, practicing our uh, spiritual beliefs, et cetera, that um, for, for a time there, it was permitted to create objects such as baskets again. Um, and I think that then Milligan later, by this point, 1850, realized he could actually send our cultural objects to London to be on the Tasmanian stand. So there's, there's the, some of these cultural makings survived through the kind of whim of the British. <clears throat> uh, my ancestor is at the bottom. She was then renamed Margaret. There's so many of our women were given British names um, in the 1830s. Uh, that's just a list of many around the world uh, that survive. And only in the last year have two more baskets been um, re refound, rediscovered in, in, uh, in England. So it's really, the, and more and more, you know, any of our ancestors could have made these so that in a way they belong to all of us through that um, unknowing. Uh, this is by a descendant of uh, Fanny Cochran Smith, the quote, who, who is the elder and matriarch of an important family in the south of uh, Latrua de Tasmania, who made this basket that you can see the image of that's held in the museum in Victoria across the water from us. Uh, and this is by uh, Fanny's uh, great great granddaughter. This basket you can see by Colleen, Annie Colleen Mundy. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's 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 um, revived as a as a skill. And um, although they're not used, to my knowledge, in the manner that they once were, to you know, um, be used for diving, the the open weave for using in the sea, particularly to collect shellfish, um, they are um, incredibly important for carrying our culture and stories forward. This is a, a quote by uh, Annie Audrey Frost, who, who um, was part of a big project about a decade ago, a group gathering and set of uh, the workshops together to share and relearn. From uh, that point, it's um, still need, there's a way to go to keep resharing that um, to the next generation younger again. This is just some images of our plants in case they're similar across where you are that might um, make in a way the same basket because the plant decides what basket it wants to be I think the um so these some called a flax lily over here and um the juncus that's a reed the rush um <clears throat> This is less used, but mainly on the mainland of Australia, used very often. There's a sour grass or lamandra, and it's very popular now to use this uh, very soft reed. So yeah, I'll stop there. I'm just gonna stop sharing that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julie. I, I love the concept that the plant decides what kind of basket it wants to be. That's really lovely. Um, that was a wonderful presentation from both of you. I think there are some pretty obvious parallels between these two objects and the stories that they tell. Uh, and it's pretty clear that both of these objects carry a very personal significance for both of you. Uh, and at the same time, they also bring this very heavy collective generational trauma uh, what can these objects tell us about the devastating effects of cultural assimilation and erasure? I, I think what I would say um, is that one of the biggest things you can see is the change in the sense of community. Um, in my community in particular, you see breakdowns of the large groups by which people define themselves, the very demonyms with which we define ourselves as a people begin to change and erode. And as you strip away the elements of culture that are transmissible, it was replaced in America with something that was arbitrary. Um, in the case of the United States, it was replaced with blood quantum for the sake of tribal members. 
and blood quantum is something that was created before there was DNA or even a way to codify how, how native someone was. And it also didn't reckon with the Cherokee concept of assimilation that we had been familiar to, wherein anybody who came in and became part of the community was widely accepted. Um, lots of the um, traditional Cherokee families have English names that they got not from being given them necessarily, but by them intermarrying with, for example, uh, British people that were royalists that fled into the Cherokee nation at the onset of the American Revolution, and still yet more that were missionaries actually decided to stay within the Cherokee nation as citizens. And even as recently as the establishment of the Kuala boundary in the East, there are several people that are sometimes uh, derogatorily referred to as $5 Cherokees that um, sold and exchanged their land in return for being a member of the tribe because it was where they already lived and they decided to intermingle into Cherokee. So losing the cultural practices removes a huge element of cultural sovereignty and personal sovereignty of tribal bodies and entities because it tries to essentialize the concept of ethnicity and nationality to a question of race, physical appearance, and otherwise essentialist traits that can't be transmitted. And I feel like that comes at a toll to uh, the culture as a whole and, and at a micro level with members of the community when you grow up feeling alienated from the people that came before you and having to reckon with that question of what am I gonna teach to the people that are gonna come after me? How will they grow up and what can I do to preserve what I know and send it on with them? Hmm. We're in interesting times over here in Tasmania because um, there's been, you know, two generations of, since the mid seventies, there've been um, an active, an active Aboriginal community that's had to come together uh, to try and affect serious change. And despite differences, it's still um, protecting culture and, and as a group, I mean, this is, it's complex to try to bring together, you know, different families, some of which haven't been in close contact for generations in order to, um, yeah, have tried to have land return to us, which has been achieved not so recently as in the, in the nineties in particular, but 14 large, uh, well, 14, they call them parcels, but land, uh, land was returned. Uh, but before then, from the 70s, as a group, you know, endeavour, a community endeavour, but had necess necessitating the creation of organisations that could be kind of approached and um, in dialogue with government. So we had to kind of create a way which in part replicates, you know, Western mode, which is something that you have to always battle with, is what, what are you turning into in order to be heard, right? But um, we've managed what is seen as most serious is trying to bring back from institutions internationally, museums, mostly um, our ancestors' human you know, remains for appropriate um, burial or cremation, et cetera. So um, I suppose what's happened to me, I felt like we've been, we were necessarily coming into the public eye as a political force and that um, has felt um, unfortunate at times. And also it meant that a lot of the cultural ways of of um, you know, making and being together in a positive sense to be creative beings um, has had to wait until relatively recently for us. So that um, only in this year are there um, a great uh, amount of uh, people coming together as, art as artists and uh, exhibiting together um, independently of institutions or curators determining that they be artists or that they be an exhibition. So there's something really happening from a groundswell that wasn't um, evident that it would happen because of the political fights we had to go through struggles previously in particular. Anything else you wanna add, Watson? Um, I, I would just say that it's something that the Cherokee Nation has struggled a long time with is the struggle of recognition um, from the early 
Welcome, we're losing your uh, audio again, so you may want to turn your video off. Prior, um, the idea of better? Yes. Okay. So um, the Oops. Where did he go? I don't know. Technical difficulties. Hopefully he'll be back soon. Really into uh, You went out, but then you came back, Watson. Are you here with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the Cherokee Nation has multiple periods of governmental organization and structure, and the modern day um, Cherokee people have three federally recognized tribes. Uh, um, the United States and its federal recognition system is obviously a Western framework for understanding the nature of tribal polities and peoples. But the Cherokee Nation in particular, since 1827, has had a constitution that largely resembles that of a Westphalian nation state, meeting all the definitions of Western statehood, while still attempting to preserve traditional practices on the ground. Um, the hybridized form of government uh, then lasted until 1907 with the dissolution of the Cherokee Nation, the establishment of the state of Oklahoma. But three polities, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, the United Ketua Band, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians persisted as historical entities. And as current political entities that have citizens in them and still have to largely abide by Western cultural practices and understanding of statecraft, that don't always apply to our traditional understanding of the world. And that also applies to our understanding of objects and space and time. And one of the things that we actually have a challenge with is sometimes there's an intentional alienation on the part of the society that we live in to try and make the, the native and the indigenous seem more othered than it is. It, um, it's a big obstacle to try and get people to understand that these traditional practices are the ways that people figured out how to do specific things to that we're in. Those particular types of baskets, based on what you, yeah, based on what Julie has described, it tells me that there's a huge corpus of knowledge that comes with learning how to make one of those baskets, learning to identify the types of plants, the materials needed to assemble it, the areas you need to go to to get that, the specific type of manufacture that you need and the amount of time that you need indicates that there's a great importance to the world in which that basket came into being. And a big element of the colonial, especially when putting something in a museum collection is removing it from that context. You know, when someone passes by that object, you can't explain to them that, you know, there's five potential different plants that this object be made out of. Here's the particular type of weaving method, and here are the schools of weaving that it came from, and here's the women that did it. It's very hard to do that in a, in a sterile academic environs. And, you know, we, here we try to do that with our traditional basket weaving, like if you go to Gabe Crow or the um, relatively recently deceased Shan Goshorn, um, our basket making techniques are a method of preservation. It's, it's weathering the past in the present and bringing us together as a community with something that is an essential object to us. Because when you learn its context, it tells you a lot about how we behaved as people and the way that we wanted to preserve that. So I think it's, it's somewhat intentional on the part of colonial society to want to alienate people from these objects or to even make you know, um, people in that colonial society feel distance from those objects. Like, ah, what a delightfully primitive way of living when, you know, there's still people around here that walk to church with their baskets and participate in one of the ultimate statements of colonial being while still possessing traditional Cherokee basket craft and ribbon shirts and things that they kept traditional. Sorry, I, I digress. Um, your basket well, lovely. It's an interesting theme, though. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Is is it's kind of what Julie was saying as well. The, what they're turning into in order to survive. It's this mixing and hybridization of what it means to be native, to be indigenous, and also trying to have your voice be heard. Uh, and I think uh, this is a good time to maybe switch over to some of the questions that we've got um, going on in the Q and A and the chat. Uh, I. Uh, we have an interesting question here that kind of plays into what we're talking about, but can you can you both speak about 
seeing cultural and spiritual objects as museum artifacts versus things that are being used. I know Watson, you already kind of touched on this, but, but can we talk a little bit about the, the power of ownership and what it means for an object to be in a collection versus an object to be used and studied or to be on someone's porch to be used as a, a boot scraper? Yeah, well, it's interesting working in the museum itself. So as a curator, I'm responsible to keep these objects in here safe, accessible to our community. But yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's sort of safety imperative that it, 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 like I mentioned, they kind of become comatose if, if and then in the visiting of the objects, <clears throat> before I worked in a museum, I mean, as an artist, a bit, you know, uh, Aboriginal person visit, visit them in other countries like overseas and feel um, sorry, <clears throat> sorry to the basket, I couldn't bring it home. Um, sorry to the basket of all those people that have not managed to visit the basket and have died or will die before and never have been able to see, spend time with these uh, objects. So there's this sense of why am I fortunate to spend time with it and not someone else? How can I, where, where can it be? And they, I do want them to be safe in the sense that they've survived this long and they are made, that not knowing it's, is it by my ancestor? If I knew, you know, if we knew who exactly made it, we would have a better clarity on which family is responsible for it. So there's a sense of, uh, it's by any of our ancestors, you know, we come from more than 20 uh, ancestral women here who survived to have families. So. I think, yeah, each object has its own kind of journey and story, and that's important, um, not, not to be too generic, but uh, yeah, there's a lot to think about in, um, like if we ourselves had our own uh, keeping place, our own Tasmanian Aboriginal, uh, you know, whatever that would be, I, I don't think we would call it a museum, but um, I, I think that there would be different ways of um, the object living in there than it can do in a government institution. But by being in here as part of the First People staff, we are, are um, moving, we are able to shift and move slowly the parameters and the ways of thinking about these objects in our community engaging, you know, being with them. We got a great question here. Um, I don't think it is quite accurate to describe museums as sterile and I don't see academic as damning. Uh, more to the point, I think, is what values people honor when they see something in a museum. Is it a matter of beauty, fitness, significance, form, et cetera? It's not bad, it's just that it is not complete. Uh, sometimes it is a matter of curiosity or wonder. I'm thinking of that weird museum in Oxford, weird in quotes, um, and curiosity cabinets from the century before. Curiosity and wonder are not bad things. Sandra, I would agree. And that's why this is such an interesting conversation because a lot of what you say is true, but we also have to be really thoughtful when we think about things, especially like curiosity and wonder and this, this concept of a curiosity cabinet, because in a lot of ways, cabinets of curiosity, especially from the 18th and 19th centuries, were ways to remove objects for, from native peoples and put them in a place of wonder and amazement and and make it othered. Uh, it was a way of, of collecting and then owning these objects and then in a way owning these people um, or the land in which they lived. I mean, am, do, am I wrong, Julie Watson? Do you wanna interject with that? Um, I, I actually have a few things to say about this particular approach because um, when concerning native objects, and this is me coming from a Cherokee understanding a framework about it, the object has to be serving its purpose to be appreciated in its context. So for lots of collections, for example, at NMAI um, with the Smithsonian, their collection is mostly, um, although they do have lots of historical things in their collection, they also possess recreations of objects so that people can interact with them and be placed into a more appropriate context. Um, lots of museums that I go to that I see traditional Cherokee objects in have such alienating language around them when describing the culture that it comes from that it almost feels like it's not referring to my culture as something equivalent to say going to like a European arms museum and seeing a sword and someone talking about all the context that that sword existed in. It 
creates this sort of vacuous space around the object that removes it from the people that it impacted and it removes it from the, the place in which it exists in the world. Um, and academic, whenever I say that, um, it's often unapproachable. It's really hard to get people casually interested into something like basket making if I approach it solely from the perspective of, all right, as a historian, it uh, occupies this niche in this particular society. It misses the point of the object as a casual thing, as a part of society. Um, curiosity cabinets in particular actually have an interesting place because there's lots of horrifying things that are tremendously inappropriate that I've found in curiosity cabinets. Like, you know, there was a curiosity cabinet that existed in a saloon in Denver that contained mutilated human body parts preserved in, you know, formaldehyde that were victims of the Sand Creek massacre. So when we're talking about curiosity cabinets and wonder, it's not just about instilling personal wonder, mm -hmm. okay. establishing something in a place and context in time, alienating the people that it exists in in space. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, you were breaking up a little bit, Watson, but I think what you said is that by putting it in this cabinet away from context, it alienates the actual people who create it and should be able to interact with this object. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and you know, um, the seizure of some of these objects in and of itself is an imperial act. Yeah. There are plenty of objects, like for example, um, the 1730s baskets that are in the British collection um, in London, in, um, I can't remember what museum, I think it's the national one, but um, they were, a pair of gift baskets that were brought over by Aragola Galan and the other leaders of the Cherokee Nation that came to sign the 1730 Treaty of Whitehall. Um, the British had no idea what those baskets were for and tried to stack them on top of one another and act like they were a singular basket that was for storing things, even though they were wide bottom baskets that if you ask any Cherokee person, they're like, oh yeah, you can play beans in those or you can store grain or other goods in them the British were like, yeah, these are fish baskets. <laughs> like it, they didn't even know how to use the baskets that we gave them as gifts and then put them in a museum and then alienated them from their context. And then they were not correct in their alienation, even though the Cherokee nation had a treaty with them as early as 1730 and has had an unbroken relationship with them since then. And the reason why this is complicated too, and obviously this is coming from someone who's a museum professional, so I obviously really value collections, I value studying history and interpreting objects, um, but I think uh, what's interesting here is that we're grateful in some ways and we're lucky in a lot of ways to have some of these objects. I mean, if we look at the basket as an example, it's only 39 known in the world that survived from the 1800s. And if they weren't put in this collection, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what would have happened to them. I mean, uh, perhaps they would have been kept with the families. Perhaps that they would have been kept uh, where they were made. Um, but if we look at what happened today, at least they were preserved and now they're able to be studied and then recreated. Julie, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, it's just that, yeah, the con it's back, that idea of context is really, has been discussed, really important because um, they have you, they have been made and taken under, in, under particular conditions. Uh, so the provenance beyond the original maker is, is critical as part of the building and, re and understanding of our own history, right? So that's, um, yeah, we can't separate these objects from what they've been through and and um, and they are also, they went through what our ancestors went through. So that's um, something that's significant and can be, I think uh, museums can uh, and should um, create text panels, whatever, when exhibiting them to by us that can describe that context, you know, yeah, because um, I think labels often would be just describing the object, yeah, and uh, we, we don't, have this the story so much of um, the basket before this basket, you know, the basket that this woman's grandmother made, you know, that was yeah had a completely different life and didn't see what was going to happen to her, her her granddaughter and the basket that the granddaughter made. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention was that, and it was touched upon that importance of we call it country, the connection to country to place. 
and that and um, as Watson mentioned, the plants, the skill in determining which plant for what basket, what use, which basket, you know, the weave, um, its purpose, all of that, um, it can come back and does come back to us if we have access to country, which is so much of it is uh, private property now. We're locked out of through gates and fences where the plants are, which are part of this larger, you know, our first, our, our land, our place is very much, um, uh, would, so it's such a big journey to have access to what is essentially non often private non uh, Aboriginal property here and and bigger than that to be able to walk country and um, understand how that how we would make a basket now that relates to that place that would be for what foods in what seasons and um, traveling to which other place and meeting which which people so it's a big learning to relearn the baskets has been touched upon is, is um, reconnecting to um, so much more like plugging into that web of life that has been so damaged for us but yeah yes and uh, we've got a question here that really plays into this in terms of what you would like to see in the future so if mm. you could pick a perfect scenario how would you want your cultural objects to be preserved? How would you want your heritage to be preserved inside or outside of a museum? What's your ideal? Might, might get fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn, between, I'm torn in that, uh, yeah, I, I think that the objects that have li lived this long have, a, have some kind of inherent purpose in that they've survived for a reason like I know they've kind of they're here to tell us something uh and yeah so I, I do wish we had our own uh aboriginal keeping place for all of our objects to come home and it would be completely managed by us determined by us for our people and how to communicate and educate us and those beyond our own community uh and um I was really, I was witness to a really moving uh, event, a repatriation event uh, uh, in the late 1990s in England, which gave me hope for what might happen, which was at Exeter Museum in uh, Dorset, where um, the members of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community arrived to be repatriated to our community, a shell necklace made by one of our uh, elder matriarchs known as Truganini. Um, so I was invited as I was then studying in England to this repatriation event and the community members that came over unpacked uh, some baskets and gifted them to the museum by named makers who had purposely made them to be gifted to Exeter Museum in exchange for the necklace coming home. So this Exeter Museum has a relationship with our community, has known named makers of objects that um, are there with the knowledge of their families and their descendants and so forth will understand that this transaction has happened, which isn't necessary for a museum that just was willing and activated the return of this necklace back to our people. But that uh, the generosity and the understanding of um, creating a different kind of relationship to move forward is what I think might be a way for our objects to to return and uh, for those institutions not to forget us or us to forget the path by which those objects came to be home. Uh, so yeah, that's one model for, I think, a future way for our objects to be back with us. Thank you, Julie. And that is a perfect segue. I do want to hear from Watson as well, but Watson, I think you'll like this question. Um, this question actually comes from my friend and colleague, Rebecca Barefoot. She works at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park here in Greensboro. Um, she asked, um, how can museums continue or begin making connections to Indigenous populations to hear their stories rather than from a curator's perspective? So how do we reach out to Indigenous people whose objects we, we may have in their collections so that we can get their perspective on their own objects? Um, and she said, what would they like to see in the field? Watson, do you want to start since uh, you didn't get to voice your thoughts on the previous question? Oh, I mean, Julie covered all the bases that like I had in mind, even down to talking about coming to Exeter because that's where uh, all my people showed up when they went to England. So I guess that's just where they send all the natives. Um, but um, 
<clears throat> this question, I really, I, I got to, hmm. All right, so the easiest way to do outreach is almost always just to go and talk to those people if they're around. Um, by great fortune and great intent, all of us speak English now, so <laughs> um, we can all be reached and it's possible to find living experts and people who know how things used to be done. And there's, a, there's still a very strong tradition of oral history around here. Um, I've got stories that my mom has passed on to me that she's gotten from people that were alive in the 1870s. Um, we're talking about people that knew a world prior to the existence of the National Park where I live, prior to US Army Corps of Engineers changing the very course of the streams and the way that they're structured around here. Um, but to start making connections to indigenous populations really does start with that open and that open willingness to work with natives and to ask them their genuine opinions on things. And most of us, I find, are pretty happy to give them and we'll tell you what needs to be done or what we would like to see done. Um, I know that I personally just really like working with people on it and talking to people about these things and discussing with them the ways in which We lost you there for a little bit. Watson. It's one of the reasons that I really love um, Old Salem as an institution that not just preserving. Yeah, um, it's one of the reasons that I like working with Old Salem is because it's inherently a living piece of something. I can go into a wood shop and see somebody actually doing woodworking. Um, reaching out to artisans is a big way that you can preserve culture and even improve your own collection because you know you could go and tell somebody like Gabe Crow hey, I want a double weave river cane basket that is watertight. And Gabe Crow could be like, all right, I need this much money and this much time. And then, you know, he'll come back with a basket for you. It just involves an active participation with the native communities in a capacity where you're talking to them like they're, you know, people that you want things from like any other group of people. Um, I, I don't really... Uh, Yeah, you're, we lost you a little bit there uh, towards the end of that last part, Watson. But yes, we, to answer that question from a museum's perspective, it has been absolutely invaluable to have the Cherokee Advisory Committee, um, which we formed fairly recently. Uh, and honestly, the way we did that is I reached out to a friend of mine, Malachi Taylor, who lives in Cherokee. He's a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And through him, we met Watson and a, a network of others. And we've connected with um, people from the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma through the Moravian Archives. So it really, it, it just started with one reach out, one conversation to figure out where we can continue to grow the network. So I know it seems silly and small to say, really, should I just talk to one person? Yes, you shouldn't, you should not just talk to one person, but often, that initial reaching out and that initial conversation will connect you to a whole network of other people. Um, and sometimes you just got to start with one. We've got a great question here about repatriation um, from Peter Hughes. He says, maybe the institutions should seek out and ask the communities not only about the objects, but if they want them back without necessarily being approached first, maybe that could begin a process in good faith. Yeah, he's kind of a few steps ahead there, which is pretty heartening, really. Uh, I was going to mention also, yeah, Team Agro work. We have uh, a Tasmanian Aboriginal Advisory Committee of um, elders and those that have worked in this kind of um, sector as well. So that's really been an important and is an important guiding group for our, for our department and the whole institution. So that I think that's been um, 18, something like 18 years um, operating now. So. Yeah, it's really it's really imperative. That's for you know for our for first people, indigenous staff to feel um, safe, and also yeah that we have guidance. Um, it's really important. So yeah, I'm really glad you're doing the same thing there. Yes, it's kind of in its infancy, but even just early on, it's been so incredible working with uh, with everyone. And Watson, we're we're very grateful to have you. Thank you for your guidance. And oh, let's see. Oh, great. Watson, do you want to do you want to uh, say something else? 
Uh, yeah, if you can hear me, kind of. Yeah, we can hear you um, just now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, um, I, I, I really love that level of outreach. And, you know, whenever I talk about the inappropriate context of museums, there's plenty of things that ended up in museums that were gifts or things that were specifically made to be put there. And, you know, um, in much the same example with the shell necklace, if there's a piece that we want, we don't really expect you to just give it up and you giving it back to us as a nice gesture. We live in an entirely gift-based culture. Where we'd be happy to make a replica of it. I know Malachi personally does lots of historical replicas of, of objects and regularly makes reproductions of even colonial period objects that would be made traditionally by, you know, a British textile merchant or merchant before being distributed to um, a chair. And we just got one more question that was at the very top of the chat that I overlooked and it's for Watson. Um, Frank was asking, he, he assumes that these regulations, so he, he's saying that the, the punishments that you were describing, were these formalized in policy at all? Um, I would need to go back and check with um, my friend who works more with them. Um, she currently works at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian um, in, in town in Cherokee here. Um, but from what I know, the, the, the slap on, the literal slap on the wrist with a ruler that my, uh, my friend Herb Wachacha got when he was going there was standard. Um, and it would be more slaps the more times you got caught speaking Cherokee and everything. And to this day, he, uh, he doesn't like speaking Cherokee to me because he thinks something bad's going to happen to me if I persist in trying to learn. And we have one more comment in the chat that I wanna address. Um, Sandra says, I'm glad I don't work for a museum. So much is expected of them today. It seems to me that in former times, their charge was to preserve and protect objects so that people could be aware of them and could study them and interpret them, just folks and scholars. Now they must totally explicate each object and beyond that, they must entertain and offer something for everyone. Where would all the money to do that come from? Um, I would like to answer that and say, I love working for a museum, but yes, um, it can be very challenging. Um, but I think that it's an exciting challenge uh, and it's one that I think moving forward, museums are going to be kind of leaders in figuring out how to become places of reflection, become places of reconciliation and um, thoughtfulness when it comes to the, the kind of power dynamic that happens in a museum setting. I think we're definitely in a state of flux right now. A lot of things are changing, but I think they're changing positive ways and it's kind of an exciting time uh, to be a museum professional. Again, I don't speak for everyone, but that's that's my personal experience. Thank you so much for joining us. And to, to answer the, the last part of Sandy's question here, where would the money to do all that come from? I'll tell you a lot. A lot of it comes from your donation and we are so grateful uh, to you tonight donating um, so that we can continue doing programs into things that uh, can be really difficult and hard to talk about. So I just really want to thank again Watson and Julie both for their time today um, for bringing such interesting objects that have really cl clearly a personal connection to them but also can tell larger stories uh, and it's just a reminder that even though we are on opposite sides of the earth, um, we do have similar experiences. We have similar stories that we can share with each other and we have things that we can learn from one another. Uh, so I just wanna thank everyone again for joining us. And I wanna thank Watson and Julie so much. Um, next Wednesday on December 2nd, there will be another edition of Things. Uh, it'll be Things, a global conversation about neutrality. Uh, this will be with Catherine Carlisle, who is the director of Mesda Engagement, and David Polins, who is associate curator of European paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. You can register online for free with a donation in any amount at mesda.org or oldsalem.org. And remember again, your gift is what enables us to continue doing programs like these. So thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you.